I'm Joyce and I'm with OC Habitat. Welcome back to our tide pool series where I'll be talking about the splash zone. The splash zone, also known as the spray zone, is exposed to the air all day except during the highest high tides. As a result of low submersion rates, the animals in this zone must constantly endure physical stressors such as rapid changes in temperature, changes in salinity, low oxygen consumption, and drying out. Despite that, organisms that live in this zone have little competition for space and are less prone to predation since they are less predators in the higher zones. As a result, there is a low diversity of organisms, but a high dominance or abundance of them in this zone. Depending on which beach you go to, there can be a vast array of different species from tide pool to tide pool. Today, I'll be highlighting three different species that you'll be seeing in most splash zones the barnacles, the limpets, and the snails. So what's the bumpy looking stuff on the rocks? Oh, it's our very first animal, the barnacles. As you can see, they're the definition of a dominant species. In this area, you can mainly see the acorn and buckshot barnacles. The volcano barnacle, or the red thatch barnacle, is the easiest to differentiate because they are reddish with ridges on their outside, kind of resembling a volcano. On the other hand, the acorn and buckshot barnacles are very similar in their appearance. If the opening on top of the animal is diamond shaped, then you have an acorn barnacle. But if the opening on top is more of an oval shape, then you're looking at the buckshot barnacle. Size can also help you tell the two barnacles apart, as the acorn barnacle is slightly larger than the buckshot barnacle. So why are there so many barnacles out here? Well, that's a great question. The high abundance of barnacles is actually due to their bipartite life cycle. That means that the barnacles life cycle is split into two, the free living planktonic larvae and the site attached adults. As a larvae, the animal floats around until they mature. Once the barnacles decide they are ready to settle down, they use the chemical cues that the adults secrete to form their own little herd, also known as gregarious settlement. But if the barnacle accidentally settles a bit too far away, then they have the ability to crawl towards the group before permanently attaching and settling. This attachment can be on almost anything, including other barnacles, snails, and mussels. So wouldn't settling close to one another be disadvantageous? Well, yeah, it can be because the barnacles would need to compete with one another for nutrients and space. But since they live in a splash zone, that really isn't a big problem. Uh -huh. By living in a large group, predators can easily be attracted to them. However, evolution has determined that a gregarious settlement is far more beneficial to the barnacles. By settling near others, barnacles know they are choosing a suitable habitat with sufficient resources, a guaranteed mate, and protection from predators. But didn't you say that predators are easily attracted to them? Well, yes, they can. But by living in a large group, the barnacles can increase the rate of survival there's actually another adaptation that the barnacles have that can increase their survival rate, which is through their development of an exoskeleton. This hard outer shell is made up of calcium carbonate, which makes them difficult to digest by their predators, such as predatory snails, seagulls, and sea stars. The shell also prevents desiccation or drying out and helps the barnacles' respiration. To prevent desiccation, the barnacle closes their operculum, which is a plate that closes the opening of the shell. By keeping the operculum closed during low tide, water is trapped inside, keeping the barnacle nice and moist while helping the barnacle respire or breathe. Speaking of the tides, the barnacles can only feed during high tide. As suspension filter feeders, they will open up their operculum and put out their cirri, which are feather-like appendages to trap the food in the water. Sadly, as filter feeders, the barnacles don't get to choose what gets trapped in their cirri, so there's always a possibility that they can feed on their own larvae that are quite small. An interesting fact about the barnacles is the way they reproduce. Barnacles are simultaneous hermaphrodites, which means they have both male and female reproductive parts at the same time. To reproduce, they inflate their penis, which is up to eight times the length of their body, and start poking it around to nearby barnacles to move making it very important for them to live close to each other. Let's review. Why do barnacles live in gregarious sediment or live in clusters? Is it to be guaranteed a good place to live, to get protection from predators, to be guaranteed a mate, or all of the above? 
If you answered all of the above, congratulations, you got it right. By gregariously settling or by living in clusters, barnacles are guaranteed a good place to live, get protection in large numbers, and be guaranteed a mate since they mate by sticking out their penis and poking it around into their neighbors. If you look along the cracks and crevices, you can actually see our next animal, the limpets. Owl limpets are the largest limpets and can be distinguished by their brown shell with whitish spots and a high bump on one end of their shell. Similarly to the barnacles, limpets have a bipartite life cycle where they begin as a free-living planktonic larvae before settling down as a site-attached adult. Do limpets also have separate sexes? That's a great question. Technically, they have two separate sexes, but they're actually protandrous hermaphrodites. This means that the limpets start off as males, but as they grow and become the largest limpet in the area, they can actually change their sex and become females. Conservation issues have actually been brought up regarding size selective harvest. This means that harvesters often go after the larger limpets, the females, than the smaller limpets. As a result of the harvesting, there is a disproportionate amount of males versus females, which could cause problems during mating. As a female, the limpet becomes very territorial because she has to protect her farm, which are her potential mates. To protect her area, she will either use her shell to dislodge large competitors or use her radula to graze away the barnacles that are in her territory. By doing this, the female creates a space where algae can grow for her and her farm to graze on. Wait, so how does a female limpet mate with all her males? Well, since the limpets move very slowly, they mate through broadcast spawning. This means that the males and females release their eggs and sperm into the water in hopes that they'll fertilize. Once fertilized, the limpets will begin their bipartite life cycle where they'll eventually use their radula to create their home to live in. So what's a radula? The radulas are the limpets' razor-sharp teeth that they can use to graze on algae or to create their home scar. A home scar is a depression made by the radula scraping down the rock that is perfectly fitted to their shell. The limpets can adapt to their environment by tightly clamping down on their home scar and forming an airtight seal to avoid desiccation, trapping in moisture during low tide. The home scar can also be used to protect the limpets from their predators, which includes black oyster catchers, gulls, and sometimes crabs. Since the limpets use their radula often, it constantly breaks down. Fortunately, Similarly to shark's teeth, the limpets can always produce a new set when necessary. Wow, that was a lot to digest. Tell me if you can remember, how does the female limpet protect her territory? Does she dislodge her competitors using her shell? Does she mark her territory with her scent? Or does she engage in ritual fighting by comparing her size? If you answered using her shell to dislodge large competitors, keep up the good work. To protect her territory, the female limpets can also use her radula to graze away at the barnacles. By doing this, she'll maintain a clear space for her farm and promote algae growth to feed on. Wow, look at all these snails. Oh Marco, you're right. If you're looking at the snails with an all black shell, you're looking at the black turban snail, which is coincidentally the most common snail on the Pacific coast. If you come across the snail shell, you're looking at the wavy turban snail. This snail is the largest gastropod in California and gets its reddish color from the coralline algae that often covers it. The snails have a couple of features that they share with both the barnacles and the limpets that I talked about earlier. Like the barnacles, the snails have an operculum, similar to a lid, that they can use to protect themselves from desiccation and to assist in respiration by tightly sealing off the entrance of their shell. The calcium carbonate shell that the snails develop protects them from any wave action and predation. The shell makes it hard for their predators to digest them and protect the stop inside of the snails. However, the black turban snails can also detect their predators by their chemicals. The crabs and sea stars that eat the snails emit chemicals that can alert the snails of their presence. Once the snail is alerted, it has three options. The snail can raise itself up and do a 180 turn to start their escape move up the incline and completely out of the water, or if the snail is on an incline, completely detach itself and just roll down. On a positive note, if the black turban snails do ever get eaten, their shells are put to very good use by hermit crabs. Since the wavy turban snail shell is much bigger, it can be used as a home for multiple animals at a time, 
such as crabs, fishes, or even other snails. Similarly to the limpets, the snails are herbivores. During high tide, the snails will graze on algae using their rodula. However, once the tide goes down, the snails will seek shelter in the cracks and crevices of the rocks or they'll close up their operculum to avoid desiccation. Since the snails are also slow-moving animals, they reproduce by broadcast spawning, which if you recall, is when the males and females release their sperms into the water in hopes that they'll fertilize. Once fertilized, the snails will float about freely along the intertidal for about two weeks until they metamorphose and settle down as adults to continue on with their lives. Now that we're near the end, let's go over our last review question. What happens to snail shells once the snail dies? Does it decompose, get eaten by crabs and sea stars, or used by hermit crabs as their new home? If you answered used by hermit crabs as a new home, you're on the right track. Smaller shells, like the black turban snails, can be used by hermit crabs as a new home and as a protective armor. However, larger shells, like the wavy turban snail, can be used by multiple animals at a time as shelter. Now that you've learned about some animals in the splash zone and their issues and adaptations, you should be aware and tread carefully, since some animals that look like rocks can actually be alive. To learn more about the different species in each zonation or other causes and effects on the tide pools, check out our channel for previous and upcoming videos. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell for future OCH videos.